is Robert Langenfeld, and I am a software engineer at Cerner Corporation. So I'm from Kansas City, Missouri originally, um, and I hail from Nebraska. But I live and I work in Kansas City, Missouri with my wife. And I've been working at Cerner now for about two years straight, and I've had previous years there interning there. I work on a team called Automation Development. and our goal at Cerner is to develop software that not only makes developers' lives easier, but it makes their software better. And as part of this effort, Jenkins for us has become an immensely enormous tool for us. And there's a reason why I'm really passionate about it. So I've been actively developing now for Jenkins for almost three years straight. Uh, I've done this through plugin development, open source contributions, um, and all over the place. And I, the more I discover with it, the more and more I become really passionate about Jenkins. So just a brief overview of our agenda for this talk today is we'll talk a little bit about who Cerner is, um, we'll talk about Jenkins at Cerner with some of our automation efforts, uh, Jenkins in the cloud. We'll talk a little bit about some of our mobile development that we've done with Jenkins. And at the end, we'll talk about some success stories that we've had with Jenkins as well. And if we add time, any questions? So who's Cerner? We were founded in 1979, and we're one of the world's leaders in healthcare IT. We have approximately 14,000 client facilities in 24 different countries. And Cerner is con contributing to the systematic change of health and care delivery. For us, it's no longer about health care, it's about health and care. We have over 15,000 different associates, and 10,000 of those are based out of Kansas City, Missouri. The other 5,000 are based all around the world, such as UK, France, Australia, in India, just to name a few. Cerner develops software, or as we call it, solutions, that serve the clinical, financial, and operational needs of hospitals and clinics all over the world. We met, specialize in what is known as the Electronic Medical Records, or EMR. I'm sure most of you are you know, aware with the recent um, Affordable Care Act and how that's come into effect with you know, different health care laws and stuff, and that's kind of adversely affected us. But more importantly, it's affected how we look at EMRs. So whenever you go to the doctor or you go to the hospital, there's lots of information that's recorded about you. Uh, the reason for your visit, your important vitals, uh, the reason for your visit, and et cetera. And traditionally, all this information used to go on a paper chart. That chart usually sat on a shelf or a filing cabinet. And usually this led to a couple different problems. It's out there in the open, so anybody, if they wanted to, could just go up there, run up in, and look at your chart. If your doctor was trying to you know, do a long-term you know, patient care with you and look at your family history, paper charts didn't allow that to happen. Maybe your family had a history of you know, heart problems, or they've had previous generations where they've had Parkinson's, or something that, another disease that could be passed down genetically. With paper charts, you really couldn't do any kind of serious data mining with that and get into that and figure that out. With the EMR, all the paper goes away. And instead of all the information sitting out there on a filing cabinet, it's now safely and securely stored inside of a server somewhere. And this allows doctors and nurses to access it when they need it most. We can data mine out of this and start to do population health statistics out of it and start to notice, OK, we're starting to seeing a flu outbreak here because of these statistics. We should be preparing for this. And it allows us then to do a lot more with that information as well. And it's not just for the bad, but it's also for the good. So not only do our solutions interact with this data, our solutions can also safely host that data for um, our clients out there. And we have several data centers that securely store that patient's data center. And these are located several places all over the world. And this ensures that our doctors can access the patient data when it is needed most. The above picture was actually taken from one of our data centers. So our solutions run on a broad variety of platforms. These range from Windows to Linux, desktop to mobile, and even client-hosted to Cerner-hosted. So as a healthcare IT company, our solutions need to be absolutely flawless because someone's life could depend on them. And so not only does our software need to be thoroughly tested, but the turnaround time if that development happens to be if there's a bug found, the turnaround time needs to be really, really fast and quick, and we need to get it out the door. So we need to be able to also have a way to deploy our software quickly and efficiently across all these different platforms. So how do we do this? Well, we use Jenkins, of course. 
With being such a flexible and powerful tool, it's no surprise that Cerner has started using Jenkins. Developers at Cerner started using Jenkins back when it was still called Hudson, so up to about 10 years ago. And we started switching mainly over to Jenkins in 2012, and it's now the majority of our development process. It really has cemented one of, uh, itself as one of our core tools, and it's something that I could not see myself doing my day-to-day -day job without. So how does Jenkins fit for us into Cerner's development process? So up above is a pretty standard development process. You, and most teams at Cerner will follow this. You have your requirements, then you have your design, then you have your implementation coding, you have your testing, and then you have your release, and the cycle repeats. Most teams will fall into this design pattern for us, and for us at least, Jenkins for us falls in here for us. And for sure, for many of you, it's the same way. Many of our teams at Cerner also follow the Agile cycle very closely. And we have a kind of slightly modified version of Jenkins' uh, Agile cycle that we have to follow because of FDA regulations and stuff that we have to capture a lot more evidence to prove that our software is not only safe, but it is safe for people to use out there. And Jenkins, for us, at least fits perfectly into this cycle. So after our initial iteration started, we have our coding period. As code is checked in, Jenkins builds snapshots of our trunk and runs automated testing regression on them. And this is important for us because if something gets caught on early on in the development cycle, we don't want it to get out there. We want it to be caught right away for us, at least. After the code cutoff, Jenkins builds what we call our release candidate. And this is used for manual automated testing. Our release candidate is sent out to our alpha and beta testing clients and physicians. And they're the ones that they will give us back feedback. They'll let us know if there's something weird on their system that doesn't work. And we'll be able to do, use that back. At the same time, Jenkins for us is running a series of complicated white box tests and unit and functional tests. So after that release candidate testing has gone underway and we're getting closer to release, Jenkins is then used to do more extensive release candidate testing, the final build, and provide white box testing evidence. We can then capture that white box testing evidence and we can use it when we have internal audits and we can write it for our documentation for when we release our software. And finally, we have our release cycle, which um, Jenkins will then use to deploy that artifact out to those release repositories. And then we'll have our delivery consultant teams and package that up and send it out to our clients. And then the cycle repeats over and over again. So just to give you a brief overview of what Jenkins is used for and who uses Jenkins for Cerner, uh, we've put together a quick survey that we sent out to all of our teams. And these were the results that we got back. About 75% of the Jenkins base used at Cerner are developers, and the other 17% are test analysts. We have uh, about 5% of our base users are solution designers, and then we have our system engineers and delivery consultants at 2 and 1%. So as you can see, a large portion of that chart is made up of test analysts and de developers, and that makes sense for us. But what are those other three roles getting out of Jenkins anyway? So, I put up a slide here that shows our brief uh, overview of what those, three solution, uh, what those three roles do and what their roles are at Cerner. So our solution designers are the ones that help us shape the look, functionality, and feel of the product. Our engineers are the ones that keep the domains and servers up and running and make sure that they're always functional. And our delivery consultants are the ones who work directly with clients to implement solutions. So where are they getting out of Jenkins? Our solution designers will actually use Jenkins with our UI automation tool, which I'll talk about here in a minute to help validate and build and ensure that the workflows that they design and come up with correctly work correctly and they work against all the user stories. At the same time, they're testing to make sure that it doesn't impact our, the other workflows that are going on that we have established because we don't want to interrupt anything that we've previously done. Our system engineers use it to build out our servers for us and do functional testing on that. And finally, our delivery consultants, the ones who have the least amount of coding experience possible, We'll actually use Jenkins to package your code and verify that the code is the right set that the client needs. And they use this by using Jenkins, and they have an AND job that runs on it. And a good example of this is we have a delivery consultant team out in France that they will actually use Jenkins to take it, internationalize it, and package the code up in the correct internationalization before giving it out to clients. And they can do this really easily without doing any coding whatsoever. They have the job set up for them, and they just click one button, and it's done. Another thing that we asked our teams was, how frequently are you guys using Jenkins? And 
when we got those responses back, we found out that about 81% of them were saying that they were using it on a daily basis. Then we had another 13% that were doing it on a weekly basis, and then we had another 6% that were doing it on a monthly basis. The 13% that were using it on a weekly basis were doing things like server deploys, uh, they were doing static analysis, and then they were doing their weekly builds. The 6% that were using it on a monthly basis were the ones, like our delivery consultant teams, that were validating client builds against new domains and packaging software out for a release. And a little bit more detailed breakdown usage was, what are you guys actually using Jenkins for? And the numbers up there are not too surprising, and about 78% of those are automated builds, and 65% automated testing. Those go hand in hand. And we're working right now to really get that last 13% so that we have about 78% of all our builds, when they're getting checked in, getting automated testing done on them right away. The other 52% are deploying code, and then we're generating reports and doing unit tests as well. So one of the big successes Cerner has experienced with Jenkins is our test automation efforts. Our software is really complex, I'm not gonna lie. It's sometimes I look at it and I think, what do I do? And I can't even imagine what our testers have to go through. And so as our software gets more and more complex, our testing scenarios got more and more complex as well. There's more advanced workflows, and this led to a problem where our test plans were taking anywhere from running from 10 minutes all the way up to five hours. And that was someone having to sit in there and click and go through the workflow. And so our biggest challenge was finding a way to allow us to not only be able to automate these test plans, but find a way to run them automatically on a regular basis. So to solve the first challenge, we developed an internal automation testing tool. And with this tool, we could run these test plans on them. We can automate the workflow of them. And these test plans were kicked off manually by test analysts, and they'd be 100% automated, but a human had to kick them off, and usually that would take up the human's resources. So the second part of the challenge for us was to get them to run automatically with no human intervention whatsoever. And this is where Jenkins really came to the rescue for us. So we developed an internal Jenkins job plugin that would allow us to specify where that test plan was, what machine we wanted to run it on, and how we wanted to run it. The plugin was really simple to do. It gave the users our ability to create a Jenkins job and add a build step where you can specify what test plan you want to run. And when the job is executed, it just kick off the test plan and report the results back to us. The job would receive a pass or fail status depending on if the test plan passed or failed. It didn't matter if the build failed or not, just as long as the test plan passed or failed. The test plan results were then also stored on the job itself. So when we archive our jobs off, we also have a history of how is this test plan ran, and how is it executed, and what is its pass-fail status. And usually this lines up really well with our code check-in status as well. If we had a bad check-in, if we go to our job history, we usually have some bad job runs, and we have a lot of red statuses that usually line up with that commit. So what did this allow us to do? We can now automate our test plans that we use for our regressional and functional testing and have the jobs run on a nightly basis for us. Thanks to the ability that Jenkins can now you know, schedule jobs to kick off at a certain time, and you can have those repeat. So for us, we have our jobs kicking off every night at 7 p.m., we're already home, and then when we come in the morning, we can simply look at Jenkins, get a broad overview, and see what passed the night before and what didn't pass, and figure out what happened. And the thing that this happened for us, allowed us to do was then, we could also then take our latest build, and it would always build out fresh and then before running this job. So we could add another build step on there that would say go out, build job, or run this bat file, download it onto your machine, and build that out before you run your test. We worked on this plugin, I think, for about three or four months before it was finally finished out, and it's been a very, very, very successful plugin for us. And this was our big reaction when we, got, we found out that we could do this, and this started to make us think, what else can we do with Jenkins? What else can we, you know, how else can we leverage this to, you know, utilize this, these testing abilities and these um, environment-based stuff? So that's when we really start getting into cloud development with Jenkins. So when your software is really as complicated as ours, you needed to be able to run on basically any OS that a client could potentially use. So we have some clients that are still running on Windows XP. We have some clients that are using Windows Vista all the way up through Windows 7. 
So Jenkins handles the building part great, but for us at least, it wasn't allowing us to easily and automatically you know, deploy out a VM and choose the software that we wanted to run on that VM. So we needed a way to run our software in environments that we could easily set up, use for a quick regression cycle, and then dispose of when Jenkins was done doing all the testing. We looked around for a couple different ways and we once again developed our own in-house solution and we found out that we could really easily accomplish this with slaves. So Cerner has a virtualization farm where we could deploy a VM out, configure it out, and then build all the software onto it that we want to test onto it. So various versions of Millennium, et cetera, et cetera. And then once we were done configuring that machine, we can save it back off to that catalog later and it's a safe sandbox environment for our developers to use. And so, since we have that safe sandbox environment, we can do all sorts of crazy testing on it. Uh, we can test you know, connection drops, we can do incorrect DNS configurations, et cetera, et cetera, without worrying about ever touching patient data, without ever worrying about touching production code or production environments. So if anything happens to get screwed up on there, all we have to do is check the box back in, it gets reset, and we check it back out, and it's a clean reset for us. It's like nothing ever happened before. Because of this flexibility with the system, we could easily leverage this with Jenkins to make it easier for us to launch these environments that fitted our testing needs. So once again, we leveraged the powerful features of the Jenkins SDK and developed another plugin that could configure and create these Jenkins slaves based on the job that was running. The plugin will simply look at the label of the job and sitting in the queue, and it would see if there was a slave device out there that was already running with that label. If none were there, it would launch a new slave VM and link a Jenkins slave to it. Simple as that. You configure the VM section in, actually in Jenkins, so you can tell Jenkins, I want this VM with these types of labels. So for example, I have a Windows VM that runs Windows 7 on it. On the backend configuration in Jenkins, I can set it up to say, for this Windows 7 configuration, I want it to be launched every time there's a job that has these specific labels on it, and Jenkins will do that. And the nice thing about this plugin too was that it enabled us to allow Jenkins to manage all these VMs for us. We don't have to go out there and manually launch them. Jenkins will handle that for us. Jenkins will also then deallocate those VMs when it's all done testing with them. So this frees up other system resources for users to use. Because trust me, it's a really popular system at Cerner and we, it's kind of stressed out sometimes. So having Jenkins be able to use this and then give back those resources for other users to use is a big plus for us. So how is this plugin able to accomplish all of this? So here's a simple workflow of how this plugin works. We have a job that gets added to the queue and Jenkins looks at that slave and see if it has a label on it, if it's restricted to only run on that. So initially it finds that there's no slave that has that label on it. So it sends that request after the slave. At that point, the plugin receives the request for that slave and it be says, I have a configuration that matches that. So I'll also go ahead and start deploying that VM. So the plugin begins to deploy that VM out. At this point, the VM takes a little bit to allocate, it takes about 10, 15 minutes. And while it's happening, Jenkins is setting up the slave, putting the proper labels on it, and making sure that it can run the jobs that it needs to run on. So when the VM is fully deployed, the slave is then tied to that VM, and the slave is finally assigned the label. At this point, this is like a green light and tells Jenkins that you may run jobs on this slave. So, Let's say you have a job queue of, say, 50 to you know, 500 jobs, and they have various different labels. As these jobs go through the queue, Jenkins will reanalyze how many slaves it has and if there's enough in the system right now to handle this workflow build. If it detects that there's not enough, it will allocate more VMs out and build out more slaves so that the queue can get done quickly and efficiently. And as it's going through this, it will quickly deploy, undeploy old VMs that it thinks are starting to get junked up with old test plan runs on them so that new VMs can be added. Since jobs are limited to run only on the VMs that have the appropriate label, this allowed us to do all sorts of different environment testing. We could run our software on both Windows 7 and Windows XP simultaneously and make sure that they both function the same way and make sure that the different testing levels that needed pass on both different OSs. This also allowed our teams to expand environment testing because Jenkins allowed us to simplify that process down for us immensely. We can also leverage this plugin together with our other automated testing plugin and start running those automated UI tests on them as well. 
So together, when those VMs report back the jobs to us, we get a whole history of what VM was this job run on, what tests were ran on that VM, and what was the past failure on them. When we told us a lot of our developers last year at our internal developers conference, this was most of their reactions. And it, for us, has become a really big hit for them as well, too. So Jenkins, for us, has been a really invaluable tool for us at Cerner when it comes to desktop and server-side development. But how does it fit exactly into our mobile development structure? Well, Cerner's been developing now mobile applications for about three years, and it was a big initiative that we undertook. We had a lar very, very large team that sat down and decided to do this. We started first by taking our most popular desktop applications and creating mobile versions of them. And while we were doing this, we had a couple of different challenges that came up. Uh, the big one was that we wanted to make sure that our mobile apps were tested as well as our desktop apps. And that was something that we looked at a lot of different things, and we thought for a while there that it wasn't really going to be possible without a lot of work. So we looked at a couple of different tools, and we kind of settled on a couple. And there's a lot of tools out there that you can use, such as Eggplant, Appium. You can use TestFly to deploy, and so on. And all these things made it easier for us, but they weren't 100% automatable. And they still quite aren't for us, at least. We need something more that could follow our current processes while still providing our developers and testers ease of use without a lot of overhead. And so we've, at Cerner, we found a way to integrate all these tools into Jenkins. There's some great open source plugins out there for them. And it made our mobile development process a whole lot easier overall. So here's our Jenkins mobile testing setup at Cerner. And it's not as complicated as you actually think it is. So for mobile teams, they have a very special Jenkins server that has a Mac mini testing cluster hooked up to it. Each of these Mac minis has one or two mobile devices that are hooked up as well. The Jenkins server treats each of these as an individual slate device. So for example, if I had a Mac mini that had an iPad and also a Nexus 7 on it, Jenkins would see each of those, not the Mac mini, as a slate device and as something that it could run Appium scripts on. So when the build is checked in for testing, Jenkins will build it out for us and deploy it out to each of these devices and through test flight, and the devices get automatically updated for us. And so testing scripts are then checked into GitHub and SVN and et cetera, and Jenkins will actually point to that repo and will pull out the scripts for us and run them on these devices. So after the devices are done deploying, Jenkins automatically runs these scripts just like they would any other test plan for us. And right now, this is primarily done through Appium. And Appium is a great tool. I'm sure many of you who have done mobile are familiar with what Appium does and how it allows us to write generic scripts that we can apply to across all of our devices. So as these are being done, all those results are being reported back to us, and they're being safely archived off. And we can use those again, once again, when we deploy out and we have to do releases on them. And the big thing that this did for us was it allowed our testers to have less technical knowledge to test mobile apps. If you've ever used Appium before to you know, initially you know, write the test plan and get it set up and running, it's kind of a technical process. And someone who's had zero coding practice or you know, is not as familiar with Appium will get really confused with um, how this works. And so because of Jenkins, we can easily set up jobs to have scripts just automatically run Appium on them. And then our testers just have to kick them off one by one. And they have no technical knowledge that they need. And Jenkins also then, for us, at least helps us manage our devices. So if Jenkins detects that there's, this device's load is too high and its you know, queue is too big, Jenkins will then offset that work to another app. Sorry, not another app, but another device. We also get a lot higher quality testing out of this. Our apps are getting tested a lot more consistently now, thanks to Jenkins, and they're built a lot more often. And this leads to fewer defects and safer software for our clients. And the, big, the other big thing that we got out of this was that we have less people time testing. Because our testers are not having to sit there and then run one test plan one at a time, they can now free up their devices to do other sorts of stuff, such as more bleeding edge testing on our devices and apps. And so that ensures that we make sure that we have our bases covered, but we also have all of our edge cases covered as well. And the best part, we get more frequent app releases because of this. Because of Jenkins' ability to get into this and get, be able to test our mobile apps, we get better apps, our customers are a lot happier, and at the end of the day, we get an overall better bottom line. 
Sure, many of you are like this at this point, but we're almost there, I promise. So as I'm sure you can tell, Jenkins has been a really vital part for us, and it's been a huge success for us. And one of the things I really want to share with you guys today is how we get teams who have never worked with Jenkins before up and running with Jenkins. As you can imagine, there are some hesitation with teams that have never used Jenkins before. And we have a lot of different teams at Cerner. And so usually the biggest things that we hear are, we don't have time to set up a Jenkins server. Our developers and testers have never used Jenkins. Or the big thing is, is that they just don't see a benefit to maintaining jobs, tests, and scripts that Jenkins runs on. And while all these things are a valid concern, we found a couple different strategies that will help encourage team to drop Jenkins and use it for CI and continuous delivery. So we have a Jenkins adoption strategy that we like to use, especially with some of our more stubborn teams. First, we explain the benefits of CI to them and automated testing as well, because that's a big part of it. We show them that the value that other teams are getting out of it. We lay out a timetable for Jenkins adoption, and we work with them to make sure that the time frame works within their busy schedule and to make sure that they can easily adopt it. So the big steps in that would be setting up a server, writing your first couple jobs, and writing your first couple of automated tests. And then finally, we work with them through the process. This isn't a, OK, here's Jenkins, bye, see you later. It's a, here's Jenkins, we'll help you get this set up. We're going to not baby, baby you through it, but if you need it, here's the documentation, and we'll be here to help you if you have any big concerns. And we work with them, and we check up on them, and we make sure that they're following through with it. And that's the key thing here is that it's not an abandonment. And once you see that they've successfully up and run with Jenkins, 99.9% .9 of the time, they like it enough that they'll continue to invest in, it, in them, and they'll continue uh, looking for new ways to use stuff with Jenkins. If at this point, if they're still really hesitant about Jenkins, you can always try the multi-team adoption approach. Now, we've tried this a couple times, and it's been successful. And there's a couple pros and cons with this. You have one of the big pros is that you have the all for one and one for all mentality, three musketeers. Most teams don't work independently at Cerner. Usually, they have several code teams that they either work directly or indirectly with during the development process. And usually, if one team within an organization uh, changes their development practices, usually other teams will follow suit. So you present Jenkins adoption to them as a multiple team effort. And you work with team leads and team experts to get them out there and get them all on the same page. And once they're all on the same page about using Jenkins, then usually the teams will follow suit underneath them. Another big thing you have is you have strength in numbers. So if you have all but one or two teams that you know, are not really wanting to use Jenkins, eventually peer pressure will get to them, and they will see the other benefit that Jenkins is giving other teams, and they'll want to fall in line as well. This leads us also to the next set of cons, though. You have an all or none mindset. If one team adopts Jenkins and finds it really frustrating, then other teams are not going to be willing to adopt it as well. And so it's either you get them all or you get, them, you get either all or none. And the big thing with this is that many teams could lead to many problems. Um, well, my, having multiple teams adopt Jenkins at once sounds really ideal. It could lead to a lot of issues popping up all over the place, uh, such as our servers aren't deploying, or uh, Jenkins is not running these jobs correctly at the correct time of night. And this can snowball out into where eventually just all the teams decide to abandon Jenkins at the same time. And at that point, you pretty much can't get them to adopt it anymore. Ultimately, though, this strategy has been found best to help work with our developers. And I hope that this is something that you guys can take back and try out if you have teams out there that are you know, not really work, willing to work with Jenkins. So as you can tell from my presentation today, Jenkins has become a really integral part of our development here at Cerner. It has helped increase our automation efforts across all of our platforms, thanks to Jillikin's ability to interact with both cloud environments, desktop servers, and so forth. We have a lot more better and stable builds than we've had in the past years. Because we're no longer relying on humans to run those build steps and relying on Jenkins solely, we have less human interaction, so there's less human error in them. And we have a higher turnaround time in development thanks to faster testing. And we also have an easier mobile development and testing thanks to uh, Jenkins' ability to integrate with Appium, TestFlight, and all of our mobile testing solutions. 
With Jenkins, we've been able to all accomplish this all in a short time span. And I really look forward to seeing what we're going to be able to do with Jenkins in the future. Well, thank you for coming today, and thank you for uh, listening to me ramble on stuff. So, thank you. <laughs>